It is evolution's most inspiring achievement, the power of flight. From insects to birds to bats, tens of thousands of species fill our skies. But hundreds of millions of years ago, flight did not exist. This is something that's only occurred four times in all of the evolutionary history on the planet. How did these animals come to seemingly defy the laws of gravity? How did they first take flight? of millions of species and the fastest of all of them the peregrine falcon reaching speeds of more than 200 miles per hour this bird swoops down from more than a half a mile in the sky to attack with lethal precision the peregrine's tremendous speed and success at hunting can be attributed to one simple trait the power of flight. While humans have always dreamed of flying, evolutionarily, flight has passed us by. But incredibly, more than three quarters of all land animals can take to the air. From butterflies, to birds, to beetles, and bats. These vastly different organisms have all evolved the complex mechanism of getting and staying airborne. Flight occurs when an animal has enough lift and thrust to move its body through the air and to maintain it in the air. But what forces drove the development of such a remarkable innovation? When did the first animals take to the air? And how did they develop this ability to seemingly defy the laws of gravity? The sparks of this extraordinary evolutionary change can be seen all around us today. Insects. For millions and millions of years, nothing could fly. And so if a small invertebrate was moving around in the forest and wanted to find food, it had to crawl all the way up to the top of a tree and get the food and then go down that tree and up another tree to get food. But then suddenly something happens. The first flying organisms appear. And once flight becomes part of the game, it changes everything. The fossil record shows that insect flight evolved suddenly around 350 million years ago. Mutations in natural selection produced the first species with wings capable of lifting them into the air. This random evolutionary accident can now be seen in the anatomy of more than a million insects. Their wings have evolved to be like curved long helicopter blades, and the wing surfaces are not flat, which make them highly maneuverable in tight spaces so that they can easily find food and escape predators. Insects are very good at flying. They can hover, they can fly quickly, they can fly backwards, they can turn very tight turns, they can go very, very high, and they've taken advantage of this to fill all the different niches in the world. Although insects would be the first animals to fly, they would not be the last. To fly, an animal not only has to get up into the air, but once there, it has to be able to take in huge amounts of energy and oxygen to power them through the sky. Considering the physical demands, it's no wonder that the heaviest flying animal today, the great bustard, weighs in at a mere 45 pounds. If you watch birds of different sizes, especially when they try to take off from the ground, the first thing we usually notice is that large birds have trouble getting off of the ground. But one of the world's first flyers would break all the evolutionary rules about size. The first group of vertebrate flyers would produce the largest flying animal of all time, a 440-pound pterosaur called Quetzalcoatlus. This is Quetzalcoatlus, the largest flying animal of all time. With a wingspan of about 35 feet, this animal soared over Western North America when in full flight, its wingspan was equal to three cars parked bumper to bumper. Imagine that thing coming at you. The gigantic pterosaur had a huge beaked head the size of a human, and when standing on the ground, was taller than a giraffe. At four times the size of any flying animal today, 
It's an anomaly of evolution. What ecological pressures drove these enormous animals into the sky? And how was it physically possible? Weighing hundreds of pounds, it seems unlikely even its massive wings could have generated enough force to drive it into the air. Pterosaurs lived 220 million years ago and were the first vertebrates to evolve powered flight. Their name comes from the Greek pterosauro, meaning winged lizard. Unlike birds, these first vertebrate flyers did not have feathers, but skin that stretched from their pinky fingers to their backs to form a wing. The first vertebrate group to fly, to evolve flight, were the pterosaurs. They're closely related to dinosaurs, but not dinosaurs themselves. The world of the pterosaur was a strikingly different place than today. Dinosaurs tower above the canopy, while down below, millions of insects buzz around their feet, along with hundreds of species of reptiles, all competing for resources and food. The ability to fly opened up numerous new ecological possibilities for pterosaurs. One of the earliest ones was probably the ability to catch flying insects on the wing. So these guys could fly, pursue flying insects, grab them and eat them. Pterosaurs also look to oceans and lakes as a source of food. They fly over the water, swooping down for fish. Being in the air also gives them a better vantage point for spotting dead animals to scavenge. New food resources explain the desire for wanting to get up into the skies. But just how did these 440-pound behemoths get there? How an animal this big got off the ground and stayed into the air has been a puzzle ever since its discovery. Michael Habib is an evolutionary biologist at Johns Hopkins University. He thinks he's solved the mystery of how these monstrous reptiles conquered flight. In the late 1920s, a group of paleontologists unearthed a pterosaur skeleton on a dig in Oregon. Included in the skeleton was a seemingly ordinary bone from the wing. The bone was dismissed as insignificant and placed in a drawer in a museum for more than 80 years. But Habib believes this simple bone from the wing may hold the answer to these massive creatures taking to the air. The bone in question that was found is the most important part of the wing for understanding the flight of a pterosaur. It's the, the part that basically connects the wing itself to the, to the body. It's where most of the flight muscles attach. When I talked to the curators at the museum about the pterosaur collection, it was in fact the last thing they showed me. It was almost an afterthought. They had practically forgotten it was there. The bone was incredibly well preserved, and Habib sensed he may be onto something. Here, in front of him, could be the part of the anatomy that might just explain how an animal four times larger than anything else flying on Earth could generate enough force to get up into the air and stay there. Habib wanted to capture high-tech X-ray images of the interior of the fossil at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. The first thing Habib noted was something paleontologists have long known about the pterosaur's bones. They were hollow. Its hollowness allows the bones to be very, very large. That is, the diameters can be very wide. It makes them very strong. It means that they can put a lot of muscle power on them, and the bone will hold up. This bone, however, was not completely hollow. Habib noticed some strange growths inside the bone that looked like support beams similar to flying buttresses on a cathedral that keep the walls from buckling inwards. They're arranged in particular directions, and the direction shows you where the bone needed the most reinforcement, where it needed the biggest push from the inside to keep it from collapsing. With this discovery, Habib was able to figure out what this bone was used for. It was used to help launch pterosaurs, like the 440-pound Quetzalcoatlus, off the ground, much like a diver pushing off a springboard. Launching is actually very rigorous and very difficult for flying animals in the sense that they have to get a lot of speed built up in a very short period of time. To launch off the ground and into air, an animal has to generate a lot of force, which takes a lot of muscle power. In birds, you see this mostly in the hind legs, because in birds, it's actually not the wings that mostly get the bird off the ground, it's actually the legs. The legs give the initial leap that starts them into the air. 
The discovery of the internal brace system suggests that these front limbs were strong enough to push the pterosaur up off the ground and propel its huge body into the air. So their wings were more than just agents of flight. They were actually front legs that they used to walk around on and help them push off and into the air. Habib's discovery may go a long way to answering some of the lingering debate about how these large first vertebrate flyers got airborne. But the question remains, why is there nothing this big flying today? The answer may be the size itself of these animals. Large animals need more food to sustain themselves. And in times of environmental distress, catastrophe, animals like this, this 35-foot wingspan pterosaur, would have had a much harder time feeding itself than a bird a fraction of its size. Their size may have eventually led to their extinction. But 150 million years ago, another group of animals was independently evolving the ability to fly alongside the pterosaurs with different flight strategies naturally selected for their size and anatomy. Interestingly, small birds make up more than half the species of birds in the world. So in the evolution of birds, small birds have arguably been much more successful than their larger counterparts. The bird's inspiration? Not the flying pterosaurs, but flightless killers on the ground. 150 million years ago, during the mid-Jurassic period, life is teeming with new species, not only on the ground, but also far above in the skies. Two separate evolutions of powered flight has given rise to millions of species.